Hello and welcome to part E of chapter 7. This part will combine two sections and the first will deal with what's written right before you and that's how you can get cardiac output off of the pulmonary artery catheter. I think this is probably my favorite variable of the pulmonary artery catheter. It's the most useful. It's the most helpful when making clinical decisions. It helps you titrate your um, vasoactive medicines. It helps you monitor changes in mechanical ventilation, clinical status. I think this is truly the um, the gem of the pulmonary artery catheter, this uh, variable. Uh, we're going to talk about thermodilution first, and then we're going to talk about oxygen extraction ratio and the FIC method of cardiac output calculation. Uh, and then followed, uh, I'll, I'll finish up this lecture with uh, a discussion on some problems and, and troubleshooting with the pulmonary artery catheter. Thank you for staying tuned, staying tuned so far. So let's get right into it. The thermodilution cardiac output is based on the indicator dilution method, um, which supposes that blood flow is inversely proportional to a change in indicator over time. And the, this indicator in the pulmonary artery catheter is um, blood temperature, and it's the drop in blood temperature that occurs with the injection of either room air, oh boy, <laughs> either room temperature saline, uh, which is colder than, should be colder than um, core body temperature. Or you're in big trouble if that's the case. Uh, or iced saline. Um, the relatively cold saline is injected at the proximal port. Again, that's the blue, um, the blue port. And it comes out uh, 30 centimeters from the tip, which is f uh, for most pa patients in the, uh, in the right atrium. And the thermistor near the tip of the pulmonary, it's four centimeters from the tip of the pulmonary artery catheter, measures uh, t blood temperature versus time. And the area under that temperature time curve is inversely, repeat, inversely proportional to cardiac output. So if the area under the curve is low, cardiac output is high. If the area under the curve is high, cardiac output is low. Okay, so this is, we're back to my little cartoon. So what's the first thing you do once you've placed your pulmonary artery catheter? You shrink that balloon, okay? I can't say it enough. Get that balloon down. I don't want any pulmonary infarction or pulmonary rupture. So now you want to get some cardiac outputs off of this thing. So this is the proximal port, 30 centimeters from the pulmonary artery catheter tip, which in most patients is lying within the right atrium. And this here is the thermistor, which is about four centimeters from the tip of the pulmonary artery catheter and this is the um, uh, this is the pulmonary artery catheter's ability to measure temperature time. <clears throat> um, on the tip of the pulmonary artery catheter here, you're measuring your pulmonary artery systolic and diastolic pressure. Your pulmonary artery pressure is as uh, labeled here. So what the nurse will do for you is he or she will inject 10 cc's of relatively cold saline into the proximal port, and it will fly along. And the thermistor here will measure that change in temperature and time. So that was uh, an example of a good or adequate cardiac output. So watch this cold saline come out of this port here. It flies out, flies along, and this is your temperature time curve. So it's a relatively low area because it kind of whizzed by. And the low area end of the curve, again, inversely proportional. So there's a good, adequate cardiac output here. Now I want you to contrast that with a very sluggish, poor cardiac output. So this is going to come out and it's going to slowly move and kind of wash across the thermistor very slowly and so you're going to have this drawn out change in temperature over time. Now again, this isn't an increase in temperature with time, right? This, this axis here is actually the, the drop in temperature with time, but I've sort of flipped it on, on its head because this is how we look at it. But this increase in area uh, is, again, inversely proportional to your cardiac output. So this is a, that was actually a diminished cardiac output. OK. And now, I forget what I have next. I think my next illustration is what happens with tricuspid regurgitation. So let's imagine this is tricuspid regurgitation. So it's going to come out and bounce back and forth and slosh back and forth and it's going to very slowly wash across that thermistor and you're going to have this kind of completely invalid, long, drawn out 
um, temperature time curve that is really meaningless. And um, shunting will do this as well. If you've got a right to left shunt or even a left to right shunt, it, it sort of dilutes out the, the temperature um, change and it creates this slurred out um, temperature time graphic that, that is, is not representative of your cardiac output and sh really should not be used. And that situation is when you, you would use the FIC cardiac output um, or your mixed venous oxygen as, a, as an indicator of cardiac output as I'll discuss next. Okay, so a little bit about thermodilution. It's sensitive to changes in technique, so the saline that is injected in the proximal port should be pushed into the catheter over two to four seconds. If you, if you have very small variations, if you push it over one second or if you push it over six seconds, you can actually have um, dramatic, clinically significant changes in effects on your cardiac output calculation. And for the most part, a change in 10% or less of the cardiac output based on thermodilution is not considered clinically significant. But more than that um, certainly is. Um, if you really want high fidelity thermodilutions, you should use a larger volume, 15 versus 10 cc's, and colder temperatures, that is iced saline, will, will produce higher f fidelity thermodilution curves. But for the most part, there's really no difference between the two, which is why um, you'll see the nurses using 10 cc's of ambient temperature saline to obtain your thermodilution. Uh, the thermodilution curve is certainly going to be affected by your heart rate, your rhythm, sa the, the saline administration as discussed above, as well as the respiratory phase. And actually what is recommended is that you get end expiratory dilutions, um, which I, I don't think I've ever seen done. But just to standardize it, because as we've talked about um, numerous times previously that changes in the respiratory cycle certainly change your cardiac output. And if you're getting your thermodilution over a period of a few cardiac cycles, um, the phase of the respiratory cycle certainly can change your, your cardiac output calculation. Um, it's recommended that three saline pushes be done with the average of the three taken as the output. What's interesting is the first push, especially if it's been a while since you've done the thermodilution, the first push tends to overestimate the cardiac output. And it's interesting that the reason that that happens is that the, the first push, that the, the cold saline, the relatively cold saline, tends to cool the catheter itself. So the, the catheter has been in the patient's body for more than a few minutes. It warms up to body temperature. So as you push the saline through the cat, uh, as you push the saline into the proximal port and it flushes across the catheter in the body, you lose some of the temperature just to warming up the cat, or just to cooling the catheter. So your temperature across the thermistor will be, will be lower. You have a lower area under the curve and it will tend to exaggerate your cardiac output on that first push. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, tricuspid regurgitation invalidates the thermodilution which is a nice segue for the FIC cardiac output. So how, what's the basis of this? So the FIC method of cardiac output is based upon the premise that the um, arterial venous oxygen difference is, in, again, indirectly proportional to the cardiac output. So as oxygen delivery to the periphery um, is reduced, um, say, by a reduction in cardiac output, so cardiac output is one of the major determinants of oxygen delivery, um, the consumption of the tissues will remain constant. So if you're delivering less, less oxygen by a lower cardiac output, but tissue consumption remains constant, that means the extraction ratio of the tissues has actually increased. The, the tissues are taking out, consuming more oxygen per unit delivered as cardiac output decreases. Um, and you can then assay that um, via the oxygen extraction ratio, which is, that is, um, obtaining a mixed venous oxygen saturation from the, the distal port of the pulmonary artery catheter. And if it's very low, you can then infer that the oxygen extraction ratio has increased and that that may be due to a lowering of your cardiac output. And um, if you want to actually calculate the cardiac output based on the FIC method, you have to have a direct measure of your oxygen consumption. Now, it's often assumed to be 125, but that is a pretty generic number and can change you know, variably with critically ill patients of different ages, different sexes, different 
um, underlying disease state. So I don't like using uh, an assumed VO2 at all. If, in my books, if you're going to calculate the cardiac output based on the FIC method, you got to get a metabolic cart and you've actually got to measure the patient's oxygen consumption, which I've actually never seen done. Nevertheless, what we end up doing is we end up using this arterial saturation um, and venous saturation difference as a surrogate for your cardiac output. And you can see they're inversely related. So as this difference increases, as i.e. as your mixed, this venous sa oxygen saturation is your mixed venous, what you, the saturation that you get out of the distal port of the pulmonary artery catheter. As this lowers, i.e. this gradient, the denominator increases, your, yeah, it's assumed to be due to a reduction in your cardiac output. And we um, very conveniently <laughs> ignore changes in VO2 when we're, when we're using this deductive reasoning, which can be problematic, as I'd like to illustrate. So just a little bit of a, a cartoon um, graphic of, of the physiology that's going on here. So first of all, you have to understand what your arterial oxygen content is, and that's your hemoglobin concentration multiplied by its, the arterial saturation plus the dissolved, the amount of dissolved oxygen in your arterial blood. This is very small and is usually ignored. So the arterial content of blood is essentially how much hemoglobin and how well it's saturated. So the commonly used analogy here is like boxcars or a train carrying oxygen the more boxcars or the more hemoglobin you have and the better it's saturated then the more oxygen content that you're going to have. Well how does that relate to delivery? Well delivery is simply the content here multiplied by the rate of flow or the cardiac output. So this would be like the speed at which the train or the boxcars are moving um, to deliver the oxygen. Okay, This is the variable we're interested in. This is your arterial oxygen delivery here. Um, forgive me, this slide gets a bit wordy. By the same uh, reasoning, you can do the same thing for venous oxygen content. This venous oxygen saturation, this is the mixed venous saturation. This is the, the new piece of information that you get from the pulmonary artery catheter. And again, this is the saturation of the oxygen drawn off of the, from the distal port of the pulmonary artery catheter. So you can determine the the venous oxygen content and the venous oxygen delivery from the tissue back to the heart. What we don't know, what you need to know to truly calculate the cardiac output is this VO2 or the oxygen uptake. And again, that requires um, a dedicated metabolic cart which measures the true um, oxygen uptake, um, even though people often just assume it to be this magical number of 125. So this is the arterial delivery less the venous delivery. So if you've got a certain amount of oxygen being delivered and then a certain amount of oxygen being returned, then it's, um, you know, by deductive reasoning, that's the difference between the two is the amount that the tissues have taken. And that leads to this um, oxygen extraction ratio, which is the VO2 over the DO2. That is, out of all of the oxygen delivered, how much of the oxygen is consumed. And the normal oxygen extraction ratio is 20 to 25 percent. So you, you normally your arterial saturation is 100 percent and your mixed venous is kind of 70 to 75 percent. So your tissues have extracted 25 percent and that represents essentially a normal oxygen extraction ratio. So if you know your arterial O2, which you can get from uh, a simple ABG, if you know your venous O2, which you can get from the mixed venous saturation, and VO2 is known, not assumed to be 125, then you can calculate the flow, the cardiac output, because the flow around the circuits should be the same. And as I mentioned, um, true uh, measurement of the VO2 requires this metabolic cart, which I've actually never seen done. So now let's talk about some caveats um, and the relationship between DO2 and VO2 because it's complicated. And these are some of the, you've got to understand this physiology to understand the caveats of using the mixed venous oxygen saturation as a surrogate. Again, it's a surrogate of, of flow, cardiac output. <clears throat> so on the x-axis we have oxygen delivery and on the um, y-axis we have oxygen utilization. So if we lower oxygen delivery, and let's say our oxygen content is remaining same, the same, so your hemoglobin is unchanged and the saturation is unchanged. We're lowering our oxygen delivery because cardiac output is being diminished. 
Well, this is just a rearrangement of the oxygen extraction ratio equals the VO2 over DO2. So VO2 equals DO2 times mul multiplied by the oxygen extraction ratio. If DO2 is, um, is decreasing, and this is actually a measured truth in patients that as oxygen delivery decreases, um, oxygen utilization stays the same. So there's no change. What can we say? Well, we know that the oxygen extraction ratio is increasing, and I just kind of talked about that. And this is the reason why we use a low mixed venous oxygen saturation. That is, if the oxygen extraction ratio is increasing, you're extracting more oxygen in the tissues, then the venous blood returning to the pulmonary artery catheter will have a lower saturation because more of it's extracted, and this is what we use as a surrogate of a low oxygen delivery, which we use as a surrogate of a low cardiac output. The problem is that um, if we want to use this assumption of an indirect relationship between oxygen extraction ratio and cardiac output, um, mathematically you have to require that oxygen consumption remain constant. Right? We're assuming that this is staying steady and indeed it does over a certain um, range of oxygen deliveries, okay? But you can get to this critical level where actually oxygen utilization becomes delivery dependent. So actually um, oxygen utilization can drop precipitously once you hit this critical oxygen delivery. And for most healthy patients, healthy young patients, this is actually a fairly low level of DO2. So it's really not something that you commonly encounter in the intensive care unit. But VO2 can vary for lots of different reasons. It, it doesn't just drop in response to um, changes in delivery. VO2 can, can um, um, drop in response to a whole host of physiologic changes. Um, for example, if, if you start pushing blood through physiologically inert tissues in a patient, say a septic patient is pushing blood through muscle and that patient is, you know, sedated and maybe paralyzed in the intensive care unit, well that muscle is not going to be very active and so your VO2 will actually appear to go down and if your VO2 appears to go down, if you're utilizing less oxygen, actually your mixed venous blood will return higher than expected, okay? Um, and that's this idea of tissue shunting here that you may hear thrown around in the ICU. It's blood going through metabolically inert tissue. Um, the converse can occur. Certainly you can push blood through uh, metabolically hyperactive tissue, especially if the patient is febrile or shivering or their metabolic demands are very high. Um, VO2 can go way up, and if VO2 goes up, well then your mixed venous blood um, will be low, and it's going to be low not because um, cardiac output is down, that is delivery, it will be low because your VO2 has gone up, your oxygen consumption has gone up. But, you know, people in the ICU like to just forget about this VO2 number, it's kind of unclear why. Uh, there's this idea of cytopathic tissue hypoxia that in patients who are so severely septic end-stage sepsis that there's all this microvascular thrombi and the mitochondria are poison they just can't extract oxygen um, so you're pushing blood to to the tissues but they just can't even use the oxygen so your vo2 in that situation will be low and then your returning mixed venous blood will be inappropriately high so um, you know, if you have a patient who clinically appears to be in low output failure and you get a mixed venous oxygen saturation that is normal or high, well, you've got to, you can't say, oh, fine, their cardiac output's fine. Their mixed venous is 78%, their cardiac output is fine. Well, no, they could have a very low cardiac output. They could have a very low delivery. Um, but for whatever reason, their VO2, their oxygen consumption, is actually also low for, you know, the reasons that I've mentioned. It's cytopathic tissue hypoxia, tissue shunting, um, you name it. And the mixed venous blood will return to the pulmonary artery catheter relatively well saturated. So you have to, you know, you have to, you can't just take 
one number as the word of God. It, you know, there's, as I think I've said multiple times before, there's no silver bullet. There's no one test in medicine that gives you the answer. Everything is a data point, and you've got to interpret the data in light of the cl patient's clinical um, presentation. So I think I may have probably already said this. The mixed venous oxygen saturation, which you get off the distal port of the pulmonary catheter, can be monitored as a surrogate for oxygen delivery and therefore as cardiac output. But a drop, a decrease in your mixed venous oxygen saturation may be due to an increase in oxygen consumption. Further, the cardiac output and oxygen delivery may have dropped despite or a normal or high mixed venous oxygen saturation as if VO2 um, concomitantly decreases. So in the absence of a metabolic cart where you're directly measuring the VO2, any change in mixed venous oxygen saturation, you've got to interpret that with caution. It's the, the mixed venous saturation is a measurement of your oxygen extraction ratio, and ratios suck. And why do ratios suck? Because ratios can change because of changes in the numerator, i.e. VO2, or changes in the denominator, i.e. the DO2, or both simultaneously. And so the mixed venous oxygen saturation can really make your head explode if you think hard about it. And lots of people don't want to do that, and that will lead you to poor clinical decision making. All right. That's it for cardiac output. Now I just have a couple of slides on complications and troubleshooting in the pulmonary catheter. So like all procedures, bad things can happen. Um, arrhythmias are certainly seen with placement of pulmonary catheter, but it's, it's usually fairly uncommon. Tachyarrhythmias and bradyarrhythmias can be seen. Um, probably the most concerning um, bradyarrhythmia that, that you need to be on guard for is complete heart block. And that can occur if the patient has pre-existing left bundle branch block because if you, um, when you f when you float the PA catheter, you can induce you can induce a transient right bundle branch block. So if the patient has a pre-existing left bundle branch block, and you iatrogenically induce uh, a right bundle branch block, then you're in trouble. So in those patients, have a transvenous pacer at the bedside. You probably don't need to preemptively place a, tra a transvenous pacer, so you just have a, transcut have a transcutaneous pacer at the bedside. You do not need to preemptively place a transvenous pacer, but have atropine ready, um, you know, have some isoproteranol ready. Um, thromboses have been reported uh, as related to uh, pulmonary artery catheters, but they're fairly rare, as are infarction and pulmonary artery rupture. As I've been trying to harp on you, deflate that balloon. Um, pulmonary artery ruptures are ca rare but catastrophic and horrific and should not ever occur, but they can. Um, so keep that balloon down and once you've uh, wedged the patient, when you reinflate the balloon to re-wedge the patient, never push in the whole one and a half cc's of air. Just push in slowly until you see the wedge pressure. Um, um, f um, become apparent on the monitor um, because you you just need to apply just as much air to the balloon as needed. Uh, if, the, if the catheter has um, kind of migrated a little more distally and you push the entire one and a half cc's of air into that balloon, you could actually cause a rupture. So just the right answer is how much air do you inflate in the balloon? It's just enough. Uh, oh, and that's that's exactly what I've said here. So some uh, problems that you may encounter with, the, with particularly wedging, um, these things like to show up on board exams. So the first is this idea of over wedge. Um, it can occur when the balloon is inflated and kind of pushes the tip of the catheter into the wall of the vascular lumen. Um, it can also occur when the distal port is obstructed, for example, by a thrombus. And the reason it, it occurs is because, like, kind of like an A-line, the patency of the pulmonary artery catheter is maintained by a, a slow um, titration or a slow drip of heparin, but this drip is pressurized to like 300 millimeters of mercury under a pressure bag. So if you obstruct that distal port or if it is pushed up against a, a vascular wall, the pressure waveform will begin to seek this value of 300 millimeters of mercury. And indeed, if this um, 
tip of the of the pulmonary artery catheter is is up against the lumen of a blood vessel, and you've got 300 millimeters of mercury pressing up against it. That is very concerning, and it puts the patient at risk for rupture. And you need to immediately um, deflate the balloon, and maybe even withdraw the catheter uh, because that is bad. And what you will see on your waveform is you'll see you know you'll you'll inflate the balloon here. It'll drop. You'll start to see this wedge pressure, and then it'll just slowly start to go up. And it would if you let it, it'll go all the way up to 300. So this is this is over wedge, and it's bad. Partial wedge. Um, this is also known as incomplete wedge, and it occurs when the balloon inflation does not inc not completely uh, cease blood flow, and the result is that there's partial pulsatile pulmonary systolic waveforms that are seen in what you think is the wedge pressure or the occlusion pressure waveform. Uh, these pulsatile waveforms, which is again the the, the pulsatile. Um, RV systolic pressure may be misinterpreted as V waves um, and then you will typically have a gross overestimation of the occlusion pressure. Um, it, this can be very hard detect, to detect, especially in patients with underlying pulmonary hypertension um, because one of the greatest tip-offs is there's a sudden increase in the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure or a narrowing of the PAD occlusion pressure difference. And if that is very high to begin with, say in a patient with pulmonary hypertension, um, you may miss it. Um, you know, it's, it can be easy to detect if it's a patient in the ICU and you've been kind of wedging every day or every so often and you have a sense of what their underlying um, occlusion pressure is and then suddenly it's doubled. Well, you might think ischemia or you might think partial, partial wedge, but if it's the first time you're wedging a patient with bad pulmonary hypertension, um, this narrowing of the PAD occlusion pressure difference can be missed in them because they've got such a high PAD to begin with from their underlying disease. <clears throat> um, when you've partial wedged the patient, the pulmonary systolic waveform is transmitted and will be seen prior to the ECGT wave. Um, so this is a key in distinguishing. This may be something that ends up on a board exam. And that cannot be a tall V wave. Um, because remember the V waves would occur after the ECGT wave. So um, if you're considering partial wedge as a problem, you need to really very closely scrutinize the um, simultaneous ECG and pressure waveform because you might see something like this where this is your um, balloon occlusion here. This is your nice um, pulmonary arterial pressure. You occlude the balloon and then you have what you think is a wedge pressure but there's only these um, single uh, positive deflections. And you know that this patient had an abrupt increase in the measured pulmonary arterial occlusion pressure. Say, you know, earlier in the day it was five, and now it's measuring 30. And you're thinking, this is, this is very strange. Um, and then you do a simultaneous ECG analysis, and what you see is that each of these positive deflections is uh, in line with the T wave. It's not a tall V wave. Remember, V waves would occur after the T. Um, so this is tr this is evidence. It's not slam dunk evidence that this is a partial wedge. Again, you might say, well, what if you know, what if this is the A wave because it's the first positive deflection after the P wave? And yes, that could be true. But um, usually in occlusion pressures, the V wave is the dominant wave. Again, that's not you know, all the time, but it's a rule of thumb. The dominant wave is the V wave, and if this was truly a V wave in the occlusion pressure, it should um, occur after the ECGT wave. And in this patient, um, the balloon could be uh, deflated, the catheter repositioned to obtain a true uh, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. Uh, and one final slide, this is on dampening of the um, pressure wave. This occurs when there's a loss of fine detail, the pressure tracing, or an overly smooth pressure waveform. Uh, there's multiple causes for dampening. Um, thrombus at the distal lumen, a kink catheter, air in the stopcocks, or a faulty transducer can all do it. Uh, and a good hint when dampening occurs is when the dichrotic notch of the pulmonary arterial waveform is lost. So this is what you'd expect to see with the pulmonary arterial waveform. 
and then this would be a dampened waveform. It's kind of smoothed out. You've lost the dichrotic notch. So this patient may have some air in the, in the catheter. There may be a transducer problem or, or, or thrombus at the tip. So you can flush this, try and get it air out of the system, and then reevaluate. It may actually require um, placement of a new catheter. So that's it. Um, thank you for the staying tuned for the final portion of Chapter 7. Um, this is, I think, everything you need to know about the pulmonary artery catheter. Um, certainly there's lots more to know. I'm by no means an expert on the pulmonary artery catheter. Um, the best people to talk about uh, physiology of the pulmonary, or pulmonary artery catheter is a seasoned cardiologist or cardiac anesthesiologist who have, particularly the cardiac anesthesiologists who have um, you know, daily experience with these things. They are truly a wealth of information. And um, I recommend um, talking with a cardiac anesthesiologist about every patient that you have with a PA catheter because that is the only way you will learn the ins and outs of this extremely useful um, tool uh, for the intensivist. Uh, but again, it's only as useful as, as you are knowledgeable. So get knowledgeable and make it a useful thing because it can, it can save you and it can certainly save your patients. Thanks for tuning in, heartlung.org. I appreciate your time. Tell all your friends, and I'm tuning out for Chapter 7.